Hey everybody, how's it going? So one of the things that a lot of you have been saying is that when I show you all these places that are empty or for rent, that I'm only showing you Manhattan. And I wanted to talk about why I've really just kind of focused on a small subset of areas when I'm showing you the areas that have a bunch of places that are for rent or that are empty and why I don't really show you the area around where I live which has no shortage of places like that one right across the street, or this one, or that one, that are for rent. You can see, they're pretty much everywhere. Uh, so, my argument, the crux of my argument is that New York real estate is insanely overpriced to the point of destroying businesses to where nobody will rent space in that particular area, and then that destroys neighborhoods. Now, if I want to make the argument that a market is dying as a result of no one wanting to rent space in an area, I think that I should make the strongest version of that argument. So if I'm going to make that argument, then it makes sense that I show you the areas that are the fanciest and the, you know, the, the, the hoity-toity areas, the ones that are supposed to have the most money. It, you know, I think it would be kind of uh, disingenuous for me to just walk through an area that has a lot of poverty or that is lower income and say, look at all the places that are closed, like all that over there. Yeah, that, that's, it would kind of be like low-hanging fruit. And admittedly, it's kind of a shitty thing to do. I'd rather point out neighborhoods. I'd rather kind of point out the places that the real estate agents are saying, this is the best area in the city. Everybody wants to be here. You know, the, the neighborhoods that are famous for, their, for the money and for all the people that are walking through it and all the tourists and all the business and all that, I, rather than go through a neighborhood that's uh, more low income. So this is the block that I walk down when I go home every day. And this, I, I've lived in this area for about, man, it's, it's about 13 years now. It's going to be 14 years soon. Uh, I moved into a mildly nicer apartment once I had more money uh, because it's been a long time since I imagine I could call myself, you know, impoverished or low income. But the idea is for me has always been I don't really have it in me to spend an additional 500 or 1,000 bucks just to live in what would be considered a, quote, nicer neighborhood. I always thought, like, you know, if I pay an additional 1,000 bucks for my apartment just to be in an area that's slightly fancier, I just kind of feel like a simp. So I've lived in this neighborhood for about 13 years, even as my business grew and my income grew. I never really moved out of it. So I still live in the same place. So I thought I would take the walk that I used to take to the post office and just show you that uh, it's, it's kind of the same thing here. It's that it, that it is in Manhattan. Because someone said, Lewis, you know, there's not a lot of places for rent if you go to Brooklyn. And it's, it's different there. It's like, oh, oh no, it's not. And I'll show you. So this is the strip. This is the walk that I take to head over to the post office. Now, I used to not have uh, the ability to wait for a postman to come to me. So if you're doing any sort of mail-in business, it's pretty basic. Like, if you have a mail-in business, what you do is you just have the, cust have the post office pick up where you are. Uh, the problem for me is that I, you have to be home at a specific time to make that happen. So I would have to be home at let's say two, I would have to be home the entire day because I don't know when the postman's gonna come. Or I would have to pay, I think it was 15 or 30 bucks a day for the postman to come within a one hour window. And back in 2009, 10, 11, I did house calls. So I would have different house calls at different times. I wasn't going to be home all day. So I would actually have to physically walk all of my packages to the post office. This is back before I could afford to have an office. So I would actually walk, you know, about half a mile, a mile down the block to the post office every day and deliver the screens that I sold. But I'd also have to deliver the packages that, uh, you know, people purchased or the mail-in repairs that I did because I couldn't stay home all day. I, I did house calls. So I kind of thought I'd walk down that stretch and just show you that the overpriced real estate that empties blocks out is not really just a Manhattan trend, it's really more so a New York in its entirety trend. And again, the reason that I have tended to focus solely on the areas like, uh, let's say, um, 8th Avenue from 31st Street to 59th Street or the East Village or the financial district or Soho is because those are the areas that are touted as being the most desirable, as having the most money. And if I'm gonna make the argument that the city is being destroyed by a b bullshit commercial mortgage-backed securities Ponzi scheme-ish 
inflated real estate market, then it doesn't, it's, it's just kind of, again, it's kind of shitty to do that using a neighborhood where a lot of the people there may not have the money to rent the stores even if they were affordable. It makes sense to do that in the neighborhoods that realtors themselves will tell you are the hottest neighborhoods in the city. So when a realtor or a broker says, this is the hottest neighborhood in the city, this is where all the money and all the action and blah, blah, blah is, and you show up and the foot traffic is shit and there's nobody walking down it, it's, um, yeah, <laughs> it kind of, again, I, 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 want, uh, to at- I want to attack the strongest version of my argument, not the weakest version. Yeah, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a walk down to right where the more businessy area closer to Fulton Street is. A lot of these places are closed, even though the sun has, not, has barely gone down yet. A cloud went over, but it's, like, it's not even after five. And I, so it's hard to tell which ones are out of business and which ones are just closed for the day. But there was a fair amount of Ferenc signs over there. And the part that really got me was when I walked to the end of the block right before I crossed the street to go to the post office. Because when I used to cross the block at the end to go to the post office 10 years ago, every single one of those places was open. Every single one. And now, well, I'll show you and you tell me what you think. I always feel claustrophobic walking under scaffolding. I know, it's a weird, it's weird. I'm weird, but I don't like walking under scaffolding. I feel trapped. Eh, I should get over it. Yeah, I'll walk under the scaffolding. I'm always afraid this thing was made by Eugene and it's gonna fall on me. Hey. How's it going? How are you? Yeah, right by you. I'm on oh. 21st and 7th. I know I've watched Oh, I'm on Nostrand and Green. It's good to meet you, man. Yeah, nice to meet you, brother. You have a good day. Friend. Nice meeting you. What a nice guy. Advanced security. Very nice guy. Okay, so we're coming up on Fulton Street over here. And this is the part that just blew my mind. Look at this. Check this out. Okay. Closed. No sign. Closed, no sign. Closed, no sign. Closed, no sign. Closed, no sign. Boarded. Closed, no sign. Closed, no sign. Closed, no sign, but sign in the window, so they may still be open. The entire block is just gone. Every single one of those places, when I was back, again, this is like 10 years ago, back when I actually had to walk to the post office every day and drop stuff off so that I could go about my day doing house call work. All of those, every last one, was, was open. Yeah, you go across the street and you see the same thing. And again, this is on a major cross section. This is Nostrand and Fulton. This is, a high, uh, and this is a high cross traffic area. You got a lot of cars. You have a decent amount of foot traffic, a decent amount of people by here. And what do you see? The same shit. Look, empty, boarded, Empty, boarded, empty. Okay, that doesn't even have boarding in it. That's just a fully open window or it doesn't have a window. Empty, empty. Looks mildly better than the wiring work that I do for my bikes. (laughs) Half kidding. Uh, And yeah, so, you know, I've heard it said that that with the pandemic that it's really mostly Manhattan that suffered and that it's only Manhattan that's a victim to the you know, kind of the, the blighting out of, the, of, uh, of local real estate. But in reality, it's not, it's not just a Manhattan thing. It's all over the city. It's all areas. And I guarantee you, if you call up any of these places, yeah, some of it's gonna be, you know, it's not the highest income area. So people probably don't have a lot of money to run a store here. But a lot of it's gonna be that, you know, they're, they're sadly probably still asking for 90, 200, or 300 a square foot or the same crazy shit that you see everywhere else in the city. Really, it's same thing. Anyway, that's about it for today. Hope you enjoyed this little walk around area. This is where I live. Lived here for about, almost, very soon it's gonna be 
14 years. This was one of the last areas in Brooklyn that was actually affordable. Do you remember when you could get a two-bedroom apartment for $1,100 in Bed-Stuy if, uh, if you were living in Marcy and Park across from the Marcy Housing Projects? Pepperidge Farm remembers. It's just probably $2,000 by now, sadly. But anyway, that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I think the only way that any of this gets fixed is if people opt out of the system. And now there's two opt-outs that need to happen. The first opt-out is that people stop renting this overpriced shit. The second opt-out is going to be that people stop investing in this overpriced shit. And sometimes I kind of hope, I kind of wonder, is there someone watching these videos who's a multi-billionaire who has a decent amount of his investment in Manhattan or Brooklyn or Queens real estate investment trusts who watches this and thinks, huh, man, all these places are empty. Gee, do I want to be stuck holding that bag? Was this the investment that I should have made? Because I know, you know, again, if you're a multi-billionaire, a hundred millionaire, and you're investing in all this real estate, you may be investing through somebody else, and they may be telling you a slightly different story than what you see here on the ground. But I'm hoping, hoping that maybe someday you get one of those dominoes to kind of, uh, kind of fall when one of them says, hey, wait a second, am I really invested in a bunch of empty, derelict, abandoned buildings that haven't been rented out for 10 years that only have the value they have because somebody wrote it down on a piece of paper. Again, not financial investment advice. I'm not a professional financial advisor, investment advisor. This is just my opinion. Something to think about. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now. And I will include a clap in here for audio sync since I forgot to do it in the beginning. By the way, somebody asked, how do I do an audio sync clap if you don't see my hands on screen? I have the audio from my little DJI camera and the audio from my audio recorder. I sync it up by just matching the waveforms. I don't match the claps, that would drive me nuts. I just match up the waveforms on screen and then I delete the DJI audio crack. So I'm just gonna do a quick clap. And there we go. See you all in the next video. Thank you for watching.